Uh, welcome back to the Justice Simpkins School of Human Rights. Uh, this evening, we are pleased and honored to welcome two very special guests to the school this evening. And I think you should think of tonight's class as a way for us to kind of zoom out of where we've been the last few weeks in terms of talking about South Carolina and the antebellum and civil war reconstruction and, and redemption periods. And to really think about how all of what we've talked about this semester and will talk about this semester has been affected and influenced by some form or fashion uh, by the legal system, especially about how the constitution works vis-a-vis -vis race and racism and the law. Now, this evening, our two guests include someone that we've already had in the class before, uh, Vernon Burton, who, as you may remember, uh, is the historian at Clemson University, the writer of uh, editor of Lincoln's Unfinished Work and The Age of Lincoln, amongst so many other great books and works. Um, also, alongside Dr. Burton, we have also Armin Durkner, who is a graduate of Princeton University and Yale Law School. Uh, he's been a civil rights lawyer for more than 50 years, and he has worked extensively on uh, really shaping the Voting Rights Act um, in front of the Supreme Court. Um, he's also currently a distinguished scholar in constitutional law at Charleston School of Law. Now, before we begin, just a quick word on ground rules. Um, of course, we do want questions from the students this evening, uh, but if you have questions and you put them in the chat, please be advised that we'll likely get to them later on in class. We want to give Vernon and Armin a chance to actually talk about their work first and really discuss um, how their book, Justice Deferred, really lays out yeah. its critical ideas of how the race the law and the constitution are all firmly intertwined together. So tonight I am pleased and honored to welcome Vernon Burton and Armin Dirk. Please give them a round of applause. Vernon Armand, the floor is yours. Oh, Vernon, I think you're still muted. There. Armand, do you want to start or you want me to? Armand's muted too, so. <laughs> so Vernon, I think you're start. Okay. Armand, are you Armand, you're muted. Uh <laughs> wow. I don't know how to tell him. Uh, has anybody got an idea? We've, we've been there. He'll figure it out. He has to get under his desk to do it for some reason. All right. Well, I uh, I think where we should start is with the idea of the title of the book, Justice Deferred, Race in the Supreme Court. Of course, it's a, Justice Deferred is a, a play off of the, the great uh, Langston Hughes poet, um, so we're using that deliberately. But the second part I find a little awkward and that is race and the Supreme Court. Now what we're trying to do is we've actually done the history of race in the United States before there's United States right through the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett in 2021. And we've used the Supreme Court as a focal lens to look at that changing history of race uh, over the years. Armin, do you know you're muted? He's, he's, I think he's getting it now. Okay. But one of the, one of the, oh, oh good. But one of the awkward things is for us using the term race because I certainly don't believe there's any such thing as race. Scholars will tell you it's a social construct, whether you're a genetist uh, looking at the genome project or whether, and as paraphrase Lincoln, my ancient faith, or even better, my mother taught me from day one that all people were created in the image of God. There is no such thing as race. And yet we have racism. And one of the things Armin and I struggle with is how does that come about? And one of the things is, I think probably the most important thing is that the court system in the United States define this term race. So they struggled with it. 
and it gets almost hilarious if we have time we can talk about it a little bit but uh what we know is that the system the the judicial system defined particularly at least initially there were sort of three groups that is whites and meaning europeans uh african americans and indigenous people but they use that term race and that creates racism and it includes the supreme court and it has a lot of implications about how we got to where we are now and the the issues uh that are there and the way you look at united states history i'm going to turn it over to armin in a minute but we always say at least i do that i do not believe that a historian could, write, could have written this book um and there hadn't been a book written like this before there are a lot of books on brown v board or the amistad case or dred scott but to do the whole sweep of u.s history looking at race and I also believe, and Armin usually confirms this, and law school professors we speak, that no lawyer could have written. This really is a book written by a civil rights attorney, a legal scholar, and a historian. And we think in one voice that's readable. That's what we were trying to do. Armin, you want to add on to that? I've been yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I agree. In fact, uh, people are asked us, well, which parts excuse me, which parts did you write and which parts did Vernon write? And I think uh, there's no way to separate them because one of the, I, I would, I think we were successful in this largely, frankly, because of our wives, especially George Ann Burton. Um, we kept sending drafts back and forth and back and forth. So it was not like I did part of it and then Vernon added something or he did part and then I added they went back and forth and back and forth. So they, the, the lawyer's work and the historian's work are really melded in there together. And uh, I'll just say this, I'm especially happy that we're here at the Mojeska Simpson School. I knew Mojeska, um, that's how old I am. Uh, I knew her when she was, she didn't look quite like the picture of the young, beautiful women that, uh, women that you see here in, in, in the, material for this uh, course, but uh, I knew her and she had a great way of laying things on the line and telling what really was going on. And one thing I think she said, it, it may be somebody else said it too, but I think I heard her say this, uh, just an example of how she got down to the, what we call the nitty gritty or the very nub of things. People were talking about the poll tax. Well, the poll tax, which doesn't exist anymore, sort of, uh, was uh, that you had to pay a dollar or two dollars or three dollars uh, in order to be able to vote. Well, that was a problem because a lot of people either didn't have it or if they had a few dollars, they didn't think that voting was worth spending money that they needed for food. But the real problem, and Mojeska put her finger on it, the real problem was that you typically had to pay the poll tax way months before the election like you might have to pay the poll tax in March of a given year, or you might even have to pay poll taxes for years back. And Majeska said, uh, said that was the real problem. It was, as, as she said, it was like having to buy a ticket to a movie before you even knew what was playing. <laughs> that was the way that she put it right on the line and, and, and got the no notion across. So and that's why I'm especially happy to be here at a school at, at Burges the Burgeska Simpkin School. Uh, I would I would talk about one other thing to start with, which I think is very important from a lawyer's point of view, especially, and from the general public and the reader's point of view. And that is that a lot of this book, permeating this book, is the issue of choice. Um, judges have choices. Uh, people who are not lawyers tend to think, well, here's a decision. This is what the court thinks, and this is the answer. Well, judges have choices. Um, every time the judge decides one way, well, there could have been another way. There might have been two or three or five different ways to decide the case. So judges have choices, and they make, they make their decision in line with those choices. And those choices might be their legal philosophy, it might be their political philosophy. 
It might be their religion. It might be uh, their personal taste. It might be they like certain people and don't like other people. So the choices may be, if we think about what goes into those choices, there are a lot of things that to can go in. But what that shows is that when the cases come out in a certain way, they didn't have to come out that way. That was the way that, in, in, in our case, the Supreme Court justices decided for whatever reason, based on lots of different influences. And so one of the things, um, one of the things we did, I think, that I hope came through is that there's been a remarkable consistency in how the justices over the years have made those choices. Now, not a, not a single consistency, but several different consistencies. So if you take a look at the 19th century and up into about the year 1911, there's virtually no case in which the justices voted for freedom or equality or anything involving equality of race. Uh, there, we start, not we start early on, there was the Amistad case, and many of you may have seen the movie, I guess it's about in the 1990s, about the Amistad. And that was a case in 1841 where the Supreme Court did vote for freedom. It voted to free um, Africans who were on a ship that was a slave ship. The Supreme Court voted with ringing words of freedom on their behalf to free them. Well, if you read again, there's virtually no case for the next 70 years in which the Supreme Court voted for the for freedom or equality or the interests of any race other than white. Uh, the Supreme Court voted against black people, against uh, red people against yellow people against every color except white. 1911 literally was the first time the Supreme Court turned around, and from that point on, the court started to wake up a little bit and started to think about what the Constitution really meant. Picked up steam by 1954. You have the decision in what some people call Brown versus Board, but Vernon especially and we too like to think of it as the Clarendon County case, Briggs versus Elliott. And that ushered in a period known as the Warren Court or up into the, about 1970, when the court really was paying attention to the Constitution. Since that time, however, things have gone back again. Maybe not quite as bad as the Dred Scott days, but pretty darn bad. So we, we've tried to paint a picture that tells a story that is not a, a hodgepodge or a jumble of, of different pieces of facts, but tells a story that brings to life, we think, the lives of the people involved, the, the reality of the Supreme Court, what our Constitution can mean and should mean, but what all too often it has meant something different. So. And I want to emphasize what Armand just said about people. A lot of people think this is about court cases. And of course, they're there. We try to look at all the cases, select those that we thought were most important dealing with race and how they shaped it. But it's about people. It's about uh, Reverend uh, Delane from Clarendon and Harry Briggs and uh, Maddie Delane. It is about people. And hopefully, if we have time, we can talk a little bit about these people, the people who brought the cases, the, the attorneys who argued them, and of course, uh, the, especially people who are resisting, but it is a lot larger with the Supreme Court people, so it's about people. And I'll just do one thing. I don't know if we have any, any particular thing. You're welcome to ask us any question. You'll never hurt my feelings. You might arm it. Or complain. Since I have been his friend for some 40 years, he probably can't be insulted any more than he's had to put up with that. Uh, but I had five daughters, and if any of you have had daughters, know that they think their fathers can walk on water until the child turns 12, 13, depending on the child, and suddenly you can't swim, even though you're doing exactly the same thing. So you will not injure my feelings at all. But I thought one way to get into this, unless you say otherwise, Armand, is um, the the struggle of the Supreme Court about defining race, because it's, it does get you into people 
in a way, and it also shows the absurdity of, uh, of defining what race was. And some of the cases, especially in what we consider the nadir of American race relations, involved incredibly convoluted meanings of race, particularly in naturalization. Those of you who know the history know that 1790 was the first naturalization act and the only people who could be naturalized were free white citizens. But that was amended during this very progressive period of, uh, of reconstruction in 1870 to include African-Americans. And probably we go further, even though I hate to break a story, Armin, we might want to tell them where this book begins since it involves Brett and this group, actually. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, it really begins 40 years ago when we met and started <laughs> arguing cases. But uh, I had an MA student who is now finishing her PhD at the University of South Carolina. Uh, and we were at, I believe, Brett, this might have been the last time you met at mm -hmm. Penn Center, isn't it? Yes. It was the last time that you met there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. At any rate, at the time, this MA who I'd been having do some research for me said, well, I've heard so much about this book. Oh, no, you folks need to decide if you are going to write this book or not, because she'd been doing some research. I think, I think she was a little, not quite as polite. She said, I've been hearing about this darn book forever. Yeah. I need to get going or, or just drop it. Yeah. I, I don't want to hear about it anymore. So we pulled out a legal pad on one of the picnic tables right outside where Brett was holding the meetings and sat down and started outlining it. But it, it really began with Mobile versus Bolden, and we discussed these issues. We argued about them forever, and so finally did the book. Well, back now to defining race, and then I'll <laughs> absolutely shut up. But I do think it's relevant to know that this sort of came out of a meeting of the progressive uh, party group. Uh, where Armin and I were there in attendance together. So uh, over the years, the Congress tinkered with the Naturalization Act. So at one point, a Mr. Ozawa, who was born in Japan, had actually served uh, in, war, in uh, World War I, had been a long time resident of the United States, thought that the new Naturalization Act passed a couple years before was worded in such a way that the requirement of being white no longer applied to people wanting to be naturalized citizens. So the case goes all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court agreed that the wording might be interpreted that way, but clearly the meaning and purpose of the law was such that white remained a requirement. But as often the court did, it didn't want to stop there. So it went on to say that white was not merely a color because some white people had darker skin than some non-white people. So the justice decided in their ruling that what white meant was Caucasian. And that since Mr. Ozawa was Japanese by birth, or, uh, or not by birth, but by uh, nationality, he was not Caucasian, so he couldn't get <laughs> US citizenship. So exactly one year later, just the next year of Mr. Thines, whose ancestry went back to the Caucasus Mountains region of Europe. In other words, he's a real Caucasian. But of course, <laughs> he's from India and he had brown skin. And the court, we could go on and spend the whole two or three hours just talking about this. It reasoned all the way to get out of some rationale for its decision. But finally, it decided that Caucasian really meant white. And we like to say that the Virginia judge in the lower court who convicted Richard and Mildred Loving of, mm -hmm. of unlawful misignation said, Almighty God created the races, white, black, yellow, Malay, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. He therefore ruled that God did not intend for the races to mix. So the Supreme Court has literally dealt with um, issues involving all these groups. And so does Justice Deferred Acts, as we said, starting really with the 17th century. And the book actually begins with the sovereign nations of indigenous people and almost ends with it with a South Carolina case. But then we do a few other things. Well, that's just a little background to give you some of what we think are the more interesting nuances that we thought people should know about as the Supreme Court struggled to define what race meant and what those implications are of course, there. <laughs> oh, <wonderful. laughs> Robert, Robert, Robert. <laughs>
Okay. Well, you want to pick up there, or well, let me let me add one more thing. I'll, let me come back to the issue of choice because um, that also goes through from early times to late times. And well, for example, in the conclusion, we talk about the fact that if you look at the Supreme Court today, mm -hmm. um, those judges they place a lot of emphasis, for example, on the Second Amendment. Um, they say, well, the Second Amendment seems to think mean you can carry guns of almost any kind. I don't know about bazookas or any aircraft <laughs> um, power gears, but about anything Nuclear else. Nuclear weapons. Any yeah. Kind. So 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 they think their choice places a lot of emphasis. The, the choice indicates how much emphasis or how they view different clauses of the Constitution. Well, they think the Second Amendment means a whole lot, and they give it a lot of ground. They think the First Amendment, uh, freedom of religion, goes a whole way. They, they've said uh, a corporation can have a religious view, and therefore the corporation can uh, uh, exercise its religious view over its employees. Um, so they pay a lot of attention to those clauses. Well, if you're making choices, you would think that if they really cared about the Constitution, they would pay a lot of attention to the 13th. 14th and 15th Amendments. 13th ended slavery and ended the bad, was designed to end the badges of slavery. Uh, the 14th created equal protection, due process, etc. The 15th said you couldn't deny or bridge the right to vote on account of race. So those amendments came out of a horrible civil war that this nation fought. So you, you would think this court would pay a lot of attention to those amendments. Uh, they don't. So when they say, well, we like the freedom of religion for, uh, uh, and we want to put the religion in the public square, and we like people carrying guns because the Second Amendment says it, uh, it seems anomalous that at the same time they are giving short shrift to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. But that's what one of the things we wanted to point out that when the justices make these decisions, um, those are their choices. And we want to hold them to account for those choices. Yeah, if you, we, we're talking about consistency and we try to point that inconsistency out over and over again. And the inconsistency seems to always go against minority group. Particularly. That one is pretty consistent. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> consistent. Whether we have a chapter we're rather proud of Though we're proud of the whole book on intent and purpose, but they keep switching it around uh, to make it more difficult for minorities to win in a court case. But it reminded me when I debated uh, the Federalist Society, when they couldn't get any historian in North Carolina to do it. Uh, uh, <laughs> this is one told me, do you want that target on your back? But I figured I didn't mind. I knew Armin would have my back. So we discussed this. And it was sort of interesting. They swapped what, after they told me what they were going to do, they actually switched it on us. I mean, they switched it on me right there. In fact, it's going to be on the 14th Amendment, but it was really a gift because Armin and I had done this. The person debate I was debating attacked uh, Judge Jackson in her, her decision when she said, of course, the 14th Amendment dealt with Black people, and it had been shown that, you know, it really didn't. But one of the things that justice deferred that we show exactly what the 14th Amendment meant. It is stated in a quote from all things a slaughterhouse case, which is usually seen as one of the very first cases that start undermining the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment. But that's a complicated story. But if you go to page 342 of justice deferred, we talk about that the 13th, 14th Amendment are to elevate a race and protect the members of that race saying race, which we don't believe in. But the fact the Supreme Court went in the opposite direction really doesn't mean anything uh, later, because this, if you are the kind of people on the Supreme Court have been ruling against minorities, but you claim you are an originalist and go to the originalist, here is the original interpretation. And I will quote from it right here. I just got it up for you. It is true that only the 15th Amendment in terms mentions the Negro by speaking of his color and his slavery. But it's just as true that each of the other articles was addressed to the grievances of that race 
and designed to remedy them as the 15th. And with that, actually, the other person conceded that maybe he was wrong or said that, well, he, he hadn't thought of that, that the uh, 14th Amendment was clearly about Black people. Let me, let me add one thing. Uh, we've got a whole chapter about affirmative action. And one of the noteworthy things about the way the court has treated affirmative action and they're apparently about to do it again uh, in the next couple of months with cases from Harvard University and University of North Carolina. They spend a lot of time talking about whether the 14th Amendment uh, does or does not allow affirmative action, but they do not talk about the 13th Amendment, which not only ended slavery, but was designed to overcome the badges and, uh, badges and incidents of slavery, all the things that for hundreds of years had been adding to the burden of discrimination, et cetera. And um, they seem to think that people seem to think the 13th Amendment was a one-time event. It freed the slaves in 1865. <laughs> but it's clear the 13th Amendment was designed to end the badges and incidents of slavery. It, we regard it as a continuing commitment, not a one-time historical event, but a continuing commitment one that has not yet been carried out and one that does need to be completed. So I'm surprised that when the court talks about affirmative action, I don't know what the answer would be, but I'm surprised that they go into the affirmative action case and say, well, we're going to talk about the 14th Amendment. We're not going to pay any attention to the 13th Amendment. Well, that, that decides their view right off the bat. Yeah. They're, taking, they're looking at half the issue and not the other half. So when I hear somebody say they want to talk about affirmative action, I ask, "Are you real? Do you really want to talk about affirmative action, or do you just want to make some political points by talking about half the issue?" So that also is something we treat in the book. And this and this was a debate was really supposed to be on affirmative action. They went to the Fourteenth Amendment, which says, "Arm and I had prepared my argument. I went ahead and gave our argument anyway." About <laughs> that is uh, white that we had white affirmative action for white people only for so many years. And this is one of those great misconceptions of history that slavery ended and that ended all the problem of the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment. Uh, not to look at just these laws of racial discrimination, but of the years in which particularly our Congress folks from South Carolina and other former Confederate states and a few others blocked anything that might help formerly enslaved people or black people in the South. And we give you an example, of course, of social security. They made sure that it did not cover domestic workers, which were so many black women or African-American men or women who worked in the fields as farm laborers or tenants. Same thing about giving, uh, distributing money uh, to, to landowners during, during the depression. And of course, all of this is controlled at the local level by white people, the way it's done. And the, the biggest of all, of course, is the GI bill. So that when my father-in-law, uh, got out of the service, he was able, in fact, to get his college degree. And he was also able to buy a home with the veterans loan in an area uh, which we found out later was a sundown town that did not let black people into it. He probably knew it. I'm saying that uh, when I researched it. Uh, and his home equity just grew and grew and grew. He was able to send his four children, including my wife, to college. And following that intergenerational wealth, that's just one example. We know that African Americans in the South, if they could go to college, they had to go to a historically black college, uh, which would have been South Carolina State or a private. And I love historically black colleges, don't misunderstand me, but particularly at that time and even today, except for the rare few, they don't have the networks or the library and the kind of things that will help you later. Uh, Bernard, Bernard, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. Talk about some, you know, we always, you know, we talk about the South and segregation, et cetera. But you referred to a sundown town, which is a town where blacks were not allowed to live. 
basically they had if they if they came into work during the day they had to leave by sundown. What state was that in, Bernard? That was Illinois. It was mainly Illinois. <laughs> most sundown town. There are very few in the south. There's a few in areas of Appalachia like Alabama, but most of them were in the north. Yeah. Uh, and, and reasons for that is, of course, people wanted black people to work for them in the south, so they yeah. didn't want them to leave. Uh, and they, but you bring up the point too, of course, that where we spend some time on redlining covenants where African Americans, even if you were a veteran, could not buy a home. And those were state government and federal government rules and enforcement. So they were involved in that situation as well as buying a home. So where most African American veterans are able to buy a home, it did not increase in equity. So we do, as a lot of other scholars have, to look at the, what really matters. Is the ratio now about one to 1 1.5 in terms of the wage gap between African-American and whites, Armand? Isn't that right? Uh, but it has hardly changed. What really matters is that intergenerational wealth. And that's almost the same as it was 20, 30 years ago, 10 to 1. And that's how we got there. And one of the things you have to show is that it is the state is involved and the state was very, very involved in that affirmative action for white people only. It began well before Baki and it only gets people worried when they see that it is going to involve black people and very few of them uh, in the first place. I think we've talked enough. Yeah. Isn't it time for other people to start speaking up? Oh, this is great. And um, I think one thing I want to do uh, very quickly is address a question that's already in the chat. First off, um, there's a question from um, uh, Herb Frazier, uh, which goes like this. How successful do you think the upcoming effort will be to rename Brown v. Board of Education to Briggs v. Elliott? Uh, when you say upcoming, I'm, I'm not sure I got that. The upcoming effort, what? Cecil Williams is very much leading an effort to get uh, Brown v. Board changed to Briggs v. Elliott. I can oh. tell you what I do. I just write Briggs v. Elliott slash Brown v. Board these days. Um, I think letting people know about it is probably more important than naming it, though I certainly support uh, mm -hmm. that. But we haven't quite figured out how it got changed. Uh, Armin, you want to give that history I've well, talked so much? No, I, I'm going to let you do that, but I want to mention something else, which is, you know, there were five cases. Briggs versus Elliott was a case that began about 1947 in Clarendon County. Uh, and it was the first case that went to the Supreme Court. It went to the Supreme Court three times, and they kept pushing it back because they were, the Supreme Court wasn't ready quite ready to deal with segregation. They had been working on separate but equal and try to make it really more equal. Uh, but they, the next step would have been segregation. That was challenged in Briggs versus Elliott. And so it came to the court, I think, in 1951. And the Supreme Court wasn't ready. So they sent it back for the lower court to look at it again. Then it came back in 52. And by this time, there were several other cases there were from Virginia and Washington, D.C., which was a segregated town, and Delaware, which was largely segregated. There was also one from Kansas City, from, from Kansas, uh, Topeka, Kansas. Um, and that Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka. And everybody thinks that part of the reason the Supreme Court gave it the name or said, we're going to name all these five cases after Kansas was to take some of the emphasis away from the South mm -hmm. and show, and to maybe take some of the uh, vitriol away. But it also is useful, and I'm not, I'm not I, I agree it would be appropriate to keep on referring and re call it Briggs versus Elliott. But I'm going to speak up for one of the things that should be kept in mind that Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas shows that the problem was not just a Southern problem, it's a nationwide problem. And if you looked at the news, as I was looking at it just before I came onto this 
um, program tonight, a young black right. boy, 16 yep. years old, was Same. shot in Kansas right. City, seriously shot. He's, he's alive. I don't know how serious his wounds are. They're apparently very serious. He was shot because his parents sent him to some house on 115th Street in Kansas City, and he mistakenly went to 115th Terrace, apparently rang a bell which, at the wrong address, and a white man shot him. So we got, you know, that's all apart from the question of guns and all, but it shows that we do have that the country as a whole has been implicated in this. It may have started in the South where we had plantations and lingered longest in the South, but whatever we did in the South, we have certainly exported it to the rest of the country too. I'm sorry to get on that high horse. But no, I but, but, but I, I, I disagree a little bit because this is the case that Thurgood Marshall argued. It was a beginning, and uh, I have spent a lot of time, have found no smoking gun evidence, but a lot of us believe that James Burns, who had been on the Supreme Court, uh, yeah, you see yeah, yeah, yeah. quite a bit, who was, you know, uh, never finished high school out of Charleston, South Carolina, uh, mm -hmm. little Irish Catholic, uh, marries up, becomes an Episcopalian, uh, ticks off his former Catholic uh, uh, sort of buddies. Uh, he's a congressman. He's the he's the go-between, in fact, to older Ben Tillman. Then he becomes a senator, described as a, a Cardinal Richelieu of the Senate. And that's when FDR appoints the Supreme Court. FDR really wanted him to be his vice president instead of Harry Truman, but he actually gets Burns to come off the court and sort of run the domestic uh, country at the time. He sort of called the president or the czar there. And then uh, with Harry Truman, he comes secretary. He comes back to South Carolina to be governor for one reason, and that is to stop or save segregation. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of us think there's probably something going on there because he had a lot of friends on that court uh, and a lot of influence. He also, one of the great things about this story is he hires the greatest lawyer who has argued before the Supreme Court. If I'm not mistaken, Armin, he's won more cases Supreme Court than anyone, had not he? Davis, he's run for president, and he's against Thurgood Marshall. And, and Armin, I like to say about Thurgood Marshall, he won cases that were incredible, that no one thought he could win at Supreme Court. He almost always won. Then he gets on the Supreme Court. He's on the losing side almost all the rest of his life. Well, let me let me add one thing. The one thing I want to add one thing about Jimmy Burns, which is maybe a a pretty high point in the book. Uh, if you look in chapter six, you will find that in 1944, when FDR was about to run for his fourth term, was about to be nominated, the vice presidential nominee was supposed to be Jimmy Burns. It was just about all locked up. And at the very end, it was the NAACP and the labor movement that said, you cannot have Jimmy Burns. And they, they knocked Burns off the ticket. They said, if you take Burns on the ticket, you will lose New York and Illinois. And the Republican FDR will lose the election. It, it was Walter White of the NAACP and Sidney Hillman of the CIO. and. Uh, Congressman Bill Dawson of Chicago, African American Congressman, those three people kept Jimmy Burns from becoming the vice presidential nominee, and he would have been president of the United States. If there's anything worse than Jimmy Burns as governor of South Carolina or all these other things, it would have been Jimmy Burns as president of the United States. So that, that's one sort of high point, I think. It's in chapter six. Armin, I'm not, I'm not an officer of the court, so I'm not bound by the ethical strictures that you constrain yourself with. But my telling of the Jimmy Burns and the, the uh, Briggs the Elliott story is sorry, did, the Briggs the Elliott story and Jimmy Burns' relationship uh -huh. was he, he, he had friends on the Supreme Court. And he had just come off, and he said he didn't want South Carolina's name on that thing. They picked Topeka. <laughs> 
in South Carolina, <laughs> that's the case. They they wouldn't even give the the people of color money for gas. They bought their own bus. And it's a big. Well, he might have. I'm not sure he wanted South Carolina to well because he thought they were going to win. He really thought they would win. Most people did. And if he and if they won, South Carolina would be the hero. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the stories, and then okay. we should get off this, we could spend the whole time just on South Carolina cases is, but in Topeka, only first through the sixth grade was segregated. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, high school, black and white students went together. And if you look at who were the plaintiffs, it was women and Reverend Brown. Of course, the reason is Reverend Brown is supported by his black church. So he is not vulnerable, but look at the Brig B. Elliott plaintiffs. They are families, even children signed petitions, and they lost everything. But Jessica Simpkins helped feed them and get food down for them, but they lost every, and they've never been recognized. When I did a, a commemoration on the 50th anniversary of Brown, they paid the Brown, and I'm not this, but just to make comparison, they played the Brown sisters about $40,000 to come speak. I brought Joe Delane Jr. there, and all I could do is pay his airfare and uh, have him meet at our house uh, mm-hmm. to give the talk. And yet, what was the most important case? No one knows about it or didn't know about it. I hope we're changing that. You read our book, you'll know about it. Well, mm-hmm. Vernon, speak. I, don't, I haven't. Her Fraser should write it up more. <laughs> Vernon, I haven't finished your book, but does your book get into the specifics of the Topeka case? I understand it was about busing, not whether the black children had buses, but how they were using the buses. What and that the obviously the British case is much more egregious, but define the, the um Topeka case for me. What was the Topeka, in Topeka the problem was that they had uh segregated schools and Linda Brown, who was the daughter of Oliver Brown, she was the main plaintiff, or he on her behalf was, uh, the school nearest her was a white school, and she couldn't go to it. And so it was that it, the segregation showed that she had to walk past the, the near school and go further on to her school, which uh, even though, as I say, even though the nearest school was a white school, so it was just pure segregation. But both in Kansas City and Topeka and in South Carolina, there was also the use by uh, Dr. Kenneth Clark of the famous doll experiment, showing how um, little children reacted to color um, because because of the their whole lives had been about color. And that's where I love the quote that I put in the picture, the arm and I put in with Thurgood Marshall, the, the famous Cecil Williams photograph. And it's just remarkable that he's 13 or 14 years of age when he takes this incredibly framed picture of Thurgood Marshall getting off what we think of as a silver media in Charleston to argue Briggs v. Elliott. Uh, and uh, we had already uh, tried the patience not as much as the, the press tried my patients, but we had tried theirs. So they wouldn't let us add it, but I wanted this one quote in. So I figured if I put this picture in, I could put the quote in and there you go. And, and I love this quote. Uh, and I think it says a lot about how we study American history and misunderstand it. But Marshall, this was right after Florida when they tried to lynch him, when he's saving three, three um, young African-Americans there, wrongfully accused, and he says, sometimes I get awfully tired of trying to save the white man's soul. Mm-hmm. So when we think of the civil rights movement, we think of race, we think it's all about African-Americans. And I'm not trying to take away the horrible things that happened and the damage and all of this, but what did it do to white children when Armin talked about the doll experiment? And I would contend it is the same thing that led people to think three men that they could kill Ahmaud Arbery, run him down and shoot him in Georgia yeah, because they had been taught their whole lives 
I mean, a generation after generation, from slave patrol to Ku Klux Klan to white citizens, you name it, that white people had the right to challenge black people wherever they were, what they were, if it's a young boy ringing a doorbell, thinking he's picking up his younger brother to be shot uh, there. And that's part of the terrible damage that segregation did. And, and I want to explain to people too, when they say, well, you know, integration hasn't worked. We've never had integration. The laws of segregation, the legal side of it, we've never had integration. And young people, when I teach them, they say, well, it was better, you know, at least when it was separate but equal, but it was never equal. And the opportunities for African-Americans were so limited, but the other side of it is essentially when you keep people separated, all psychology, all history shows that we project our worst fantasies, our worst fears on other groups of people. Absolutely. And that's what these laws did. They made it illegal for black and white to meet together. They made it illegal for black and whites to work in the mill together, which is why, why poor whites at least had jobs when the farming was failing, but African-Americans couldn't even work there. So it's why Penn Center was so important. It was isolated. And that's where people could go to and not be seen to meet together to try to get America's better angels moving in South Carolina and other places at the time. Vernon, you, one, of, one of your comments reminded me of something. You were talking about how the segregation laws sometimes were pretty far reaching or crazy. Um, the city of Greenville, South Carolina, had a city ordinance that <laughs> came up in, in during this the uh, sit-in movements. It was a case called Peterson versus City of Greenville that we talk about in Chapter Eight. And the city ordinance there was that black and white people could not had to be uh, in separate rooms in lunch rooms or cafeterias unless. They could be in the same room if they were a certain number of feet apart at table at separate tables, and as long as the dishes and silverware had to be washed in separate dishwashers or separate sinks. Mm -hmm. Much has changed. You know, we could do a whole session just on South Carolina, and then I will shut up for sure, Armin. I promise. But uh, South Carolina. And Clemson is the reason, I think, has got away with murder in terms of their reputation. Uh, it is so important what happened in South Carolina historically. But when people think of the civil rights movement, they think of Mississippi, they think of Alabama. But it's even more than that. If you look at the history, you can look at a Walter Hines page, and he said in his writings, it would be better to be an imp in Hades than a colored person in South Carolina. He didn't say Mississippi, he said South Carolina. But when when there was not the violence and uh, with the integration of Clemson and a, a, a leading manufacturer industrialist created this idea of integration with dignity, I can assure you the only dignity was Harvey Gantt and Matthew Perry, as far as I can tell from the South Carolina side. Uh, we sort of shifted this idea and those of us in South Carolina look down our nose and say, we're not like those rednecks down in Georgia and Alabama and Louisiana. <laughs> when in fact, the it history, the hi right. yeah, I think, mm -hmm. and, and Jimmy Burns in some ways was smarter. When Arm and I were doing a case in Charleston, I found this, this letter that we actually used uh, with the Justice Department. Remember where Burns says, well, I mean, he figured it out. If we do lose, he didn't think we would. We don't have to worry because of sort of laws of residential segregation, we can still have mainly segregated schools. Yeah. Uh, but and we Burns do. and others actually use the law as a way to postpone and change what was supposed to be in integration. And, and they were able to manipulate law. South Carolina, though, the case that calls for ending school segregation begins in South Carolina, ruled on South Carolina, it's the last state to integrate the schools as public schools. 
think this is a lot for us to digest. <laughs> Um, I, I do see a question, so I think we're going to jump into uh, getting questions from the audience, both here and on the chat. And there is a question from Cecil Rigby that relates to the Dred Scott decision. Uh, the question is this, uh, Chief Justice Roger Tawney had gotten what he wanted with no citizenship for Dred Scott and Black Americans. So why did the Supreme Court get involved in arguments over the Missouri Compromise? That's Cecil Rigby's question. Go ahead, Armin. This is, okay. this is, then I'll, then I'll, tell, I'll tell him what you wouldn't let me put in the book, okay? We spend a lot of time on that, on that specific question, because it makes no, it made no sense at all. Uh, the, the, court, the majority, well, it was perfectly consistent the fact that they went out of their way to decide a question that they had no jurisdiction for, no business deciding, it is perfectly consistent with a principle that has been used throughout our history. And that consistent principle, uh, I'll take a break, it was also the principle used when Congress blocked Merrick Garland from even being considered for the Supreme Court in 2016 on the theory that you can't, well, you can't pick a new justice during an election year. And then four years later, and Merrick Garland, that, that came up in like in the spring. I think uh, Justice Scalia died in February. Merrick Garland was named in March. I think uh, we did the days in the book. You can look up the actual number of days. Right. Okay. But in 2020, when uh, Justice Ginsburg died, I'm sorry, what? When Justice Ginsburg died. Five days. Okay. Great. She died just before the election, and they went ahead. Um, it's not inconsistent at all. It's consistent with a great principle of government, not just American government, all government. And the principle is, if you have the votes, you don't need to explain anything. <laughs> so, but yeah, the short answer is that the Supreme Court, in fact, when they looked around and had the votes, what they really wanted to do was end the Missouri Compromise. Uh, what, what, the, what was going on at that point was uh, bleeding Kansas. There were all kinds of fights about Kansas and Nebraska. Um, <laughs> they had just been fighting about California and New Mexico. And the, su the Southern states wanted to make sure that they could carry uh, slavery everywhere. And the Supreme Court having five slaveholders on it was bound and determined to make that political move. So in fact, that was a much more important issue for the court in its political unwisdom than the than the question of whether uh, Dred Scott was a citizen or not. But it, the interesting politics. thing, Armin, is you might want to tell him, uh, Tony actually thought he was avoiding civil war. This would be the case that would um, make sure that people at the time, of course, knew they were on the brink and they were worried about civil war. So yeah. he actually thought that. And the other thing that's most interesting to me is, of course, the laws at that time, even in South Carolina, Dred Scott, if they had followed precedent, would have been free. And also, it's not just Dred Scott, it is Miss Scott as well uh, that's, part of the, that's part of the case. But and here's another thing about the Dred Scott case. Um, when Dred Scott, first, when the Scots first went to court in the state of Missouri, they won their case, and they won their case because um, he had been taken by his owner, master, whatever you want to call it, who was an army doctor. He'd been taken to three places for several years to Illinois, which was a free state. The doctor was stationed in Rock Island, Illinois, for several years and then to the Wisconsin Territory, what is now actually part of Minnesota. So he'd been taken voluntarily by his master, owner, to three places. And the law of Missouri that they had, that the Missouri Supreme Court had ruled again and again and again and again, eight times, was that if you were if a slave was taken voluntarily to, a, to three places for a, a real period of time, not just a few days, 
but a real period of time, then that slave was free. The doctrine was called once free, always free. And that's what he won with in the lower courts. And when it got to the Supreme Court of Missouri, the Supreme Court of Missouri said, well, we understand that's our law, but times now are not as they were when those cases were decided. And since that time, we have been under attack and criticism by these northern states that want to destroy our, our system of government, our way of life, the good old way of life. They want to destroy it. And therefore, we are not going to give them an inch and we are turning the law around. And Armin wouldn't let me put this in, but as a historian, I love historical patterns. He thought we'd beat up on Judge Roberts too bad. <laughs> but I, I, I really, it, it really struck home. So both Armin and I met on a voting rights case in 1980. And that's where we became friends, as I like to say, sort of out of Rick and Casablanca, the beginning of a, of a beautiful friendship and arguments about the meaning of the law. Uh, but when Shelby V. Holden in 2013 really gutted the civil, gutted the Voting Rights Act of 1965, getting rid of, well, Section 4, I guess was unconstitutional, but meaning there's no way to enforce Section 5. Judge Roberts' almost exact words were what were said in Dred Scott, times are not as they were, meaning old oh, things have gotten better. And then in the uh, case I was just doing in Georgia, still still going to court, in fact, on the SB 202, uh, but I can I think I can talk about it now, Ken Armin, since I've been deposed and they have a report. I assume I can. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I was asked by the attorneys that uh, uh, Judge Alito had said that times are not as they were in 1982. 1982 is when the Voting Rights Act was renewed, and Armand was one of the chief architects that sort of earned the, uh, the title of the intellectual of the civil rights lawyers uh, and was sort of in charge of getting that done. Uh, and he says things are not as they were in 1982. And so the attorneys wanted me to research and compare. And I said, well, Alito is right, actually. And they were shocked. And I said, it's not like in 1982 when they, no one was challenging really people's rights to vote. They were trying to find ways to dilute that vote, have them have as little meaning as they could by going to at large. And we are back where we were in 1898, it seems to me with uh, Williams v. Mississippi, where we are trying to, at least states are trying to stop people from voting at all. But I just find it very interesting that it's always, it's not as it was back then. And something we haven't mentioned that I found very interesting, and Armin probably knew it, but as a historian, the importance of reading the sense. Because we, so often in history, we'll say, well, you know, Tony was a man of his time. He did not know better. I mean, it's different then. Read the dissents. They call it right out. They say, the dissents say, you know, in North Carolina, a state that enslaved people, Black people could vote at the time of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Black people could vote up until uh, after Nat Turner's uh, rebellion. So those dissents were really eye-opening to me as someone who had all my life heard, well, you know, that was the 19th century. That was the 18th century. There were always people there to show that there was an alternative or to tell the truth. They just didn't listen to it. Mm -hmm. um, we did the same thing in almost all of the cases. <laughs> it was, to bring, yeah. bring the question back to the very beginning. The point is uh, slavery in the territories and whether it would, whether, whether it could be kept out of the territories was the most crucial issue in the 1850s. It's why Franklin Pierce didn't get reelected. It's why the Republican Party was formed. It was the backdrop uh, in 1860, uh, 1856 when James Buchanan was inaugurated and it stayed and it, it's it was really the political powder keg. And that's what the Supreme Court thought it was ending instead of really beginning. Tell them the Buchanan story, Armin. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, James Buchanan was elected in 1856, and he he, he was the Democrat. He, would, he actually didn't get a majority of the vote because 
the, Re the new Republican Party and the Know Nothing Party together got a lot more votes for Buchanan with our electoral college system, uh, won a majority. So he's, get, he's elected president. And as I say, the big issue of the day was slavery in the territories. Um, and so Buchanan got up and it, at his inaugural vote, at his inaugural address, that was the big issue he talked about. He said, we know the big issue is slavery in the territories, but it's not necessarily a political issue. It's in the court right now. It's in the Supreme Court. Supreme Court's going to decide the issue. And however it decides, win or lose, right or left, what, yes or no, whatever, I will, I will defer to whatever the Supreme Court says, and I hope all of our countrymen will do the same. Well, he was not really taking a gamble. It sounded almost, you know, he was going out on a limb, you would think, except that he had been talking and corresponding with his friends on the Supreme Court, particularly Robert Greer, who was a justice from Pennsylvania, like Buchanan was uh, from Pennsylvania. And Greer and another justice were telling him all the time what was going on. The Supreme Court had already written, uh, heard the argument and written the opinions. And his part, inaugural address was March the 4th. And lo and behold, on March the 6th, here comes the Supreme Court decision deciding that very issue. And you, in the book, we say it's almost as if he had inside information. Well, it wasn't almost as if he had it. He had inside information. So when he went out on a limb and said, I'll abide by their ruling, whatever it is. He knew exactly what the ruling was. And more than that, uh, initially, the Southerners on the court, the five of them all got together on the most extreme position. And he got Greer to add, Greer had not gone along with that. He was a Northerner, Northern Democrat. So Buchanan asked Greer to put another paragraph in his opinion, just say, well, I agree with the Southerners on this issue because Buchanan was trying to make it look like not a sectional issue. So mm -hmm. there's politics throughout, up and down, in and out, uh, every step of the way. And that's part of what we're trying to get, we were trying to get across in the case, in the book. So thank you for that great question. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brett, you wanted to recognize the guest. Yeah, and I, I did. did. Uh, I had solicited Jay Bender to come because he's, I, I'm sure, as much a fan of the or just today as, as I am, but Jay also is um, the, uh, the 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 marginal line between us and free speech, <laughs> and, uh, and Jay has been a, a longtime supporter and I appreciate his being here because we still need his help. Thank you for coming, Jay. You may have a question for the for our presenter today. Yeah, yeah. or not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's laughing now, but he's still muted. Uh, I'm temporarily unmuted. <laughs> we hear you. Yes, I'm here. Well, okay. I just want you to have the opportunity to say something to Armin and and, um, and Vernon. They may they may want to know about your reportage on the Murdoch case that we. I'm, I'm oh. thrilled to I'm thrilled to be in the same room, even digitally, with those two scholars. <laughs> Have you been writing about the Murdoch case? And when, when I think of the Murdoch case, I actually think of the Murdoch boys, the Murdoch gang. You got Alex in Hampton County and you got Rupert in Delaware. Yeah, uh, that's right. Quite a gang uh, together. No, I've, uh, I've been following the Delaware case uh, with great interest, but I was appointed by uh, Judge Newman to be the liaison between the court and the press in the oh. Alec Murdoch murders cases. And I spent six weeks down in Walterboro uh, herding cats. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, tell us something about that. Well, I sat about uh, six or eight feet away from Alec uh, during the trial because my assigned seat was in the grand jury box on the side of the courtroom where the defense table was and I started off looking at him thinking he was a sociopath and by the end of six weeks I concluded he was a psychopath <laughs> and the NPR reporter who was sitting in front of me turned around one day and said uh, have you looked in that guy's eyes 
I said, yeah, there's no there there. Uh, just uh, <laughs> two blank holes in his skull. Uh, <laughs> wow. It, it, it was interesting. The, uh, the Judge Newman did a wonderful job. One of the things I'm sorry, line is that uh, every, I think, from what I understand, we, we've all assumed that his lawyers urged him not to testify, but that he was bound and determined because he believed he could persuade anybody of anything. Well, he is a raging narcissist. There's no question about that. And neither Harputlian nor Griffin told me that they tried to dissuade him from testifying. But I have from a source that I believe to be connected closely with him, that not only did they tell him not to testify, they had other well-known criminal defense lawyers in South Carolina calling him telling him not to testify. And the day before he took the stand, Griffin moved to exclude cross-examination on all of the financial crimes. Right. And Newman said, I'm not going to give an advisory opinion, but it's my belief that if you take the stand, uh, you're, you have no Fifth Amendment privilege that you can invoke from time to time. And I always thought that was kabuki theater to let <laughs> right. to, to let Murdoch know yes. that he was going to be cross-examined on every item of misconduct that the prosecution had entered into evidence and uh, it turned out to be so uh, i i think that he believed he Murdoch believed he could lie his way through it and he uh, always lied before that's what well, okay. This is what we call in, in the court a sidebar. Return, return, return order to Dr. Green. Dr. Green, thank you, Jay. You need to hear that. That was good. I, I would like I would like to say one thing about Jimmy Burns uh, because his name figured prominently here, and I've I've heard the story too that Burns uh, talked to his friends on the Supreme Court to keep Briggs from being the first case, and you talk about. Uh, dissents, read uh, the dissent uh, by Wade Swearing in the three-judge panel that heard Briggs before it got to the Supreme Court. That's the roadmap for the decision in Briggs v. Elliott at the Supreme Court. He, he laid it out for them. But we have a sales tax in South Carolina, I believe, because Burns sold it on the basis that they would use the money to make the black schools equal to the white schools, which, of course, uh, was as big a lie as any he told in, in politics. There was never any intention to do it, but that was the device to get us a sales tax. They actually, in 96, South Carolina built a very nice physical building, much better than the white school that I was in, but it was just because it was brick and not a, you know, old two-story kind of kind of house. So there were some, I actually have a, a friend who's an uh, archeologist and art historian who's been studying these schools. They have a certain name, I forget what it is. And uh, they become sort of like Rosenwald schools as a, uh, something to be studied. Before we leave, Armin, I think you ought to, you ought to tell the story uh, Ms. Mary Hamilton, this is we, we got a lot. We got a lot of time left, but I before and that's worth doing. But before we do that, I want to I want to come back to uh, Jimmy Burns and Waitus Waring and Harry Truman and all because what you just brought up is really we, we tell another part of the story about Waitus Waring. Um, in uh, you all you all are familiar with that wonderful book. Uh, uh, what is it? Un Unexampled yep. courage. About the uh, the case, excuse me, um, about the uh, case that Judge Waring heard the brutal the brutal beating to death uh, in South Carolina, um, and not to death, just blinding. I'm sorry, what the blind? Yeah. I'm sorry, blinding, sorry. blinding, yeah. blinding. I'm sorry. They would have liked to kill. Isaac Woodard, and as we've described in the book in just a couple of pages, but Judge Gergel has gone on. Um, Judge Waring had been appointed. Judge Waring was part of the Charleston machine. He was 
he was as traditional a Southerner as you could get, although he's a decent person, um, uh, not a not a an active bigot, but he but he was part he was an old time segregationist. He got on the bench, became a judge. He issued a couple of um, small progressive rulings. He uh, equalized teacher pay in Columbia, I think, in in Mrs. Simpson's case, uh, and uh, but nothing out of the ordinary. And then he, then Sergeant Isaac Woodard was blinded on his way home from being mustered out. This is 1946, I guess. Um, and, and Judge Waring was assigned to try that case. And so Judge Gurgle has gone into it in great detail, but we mentioned it briefly. And the case, of course, got nowhere because, and part of it had to do with what the Supreme Court had the rules that the Supreme Court had laid down for how what you have to prove in a case of police brutality. But as we point out, mm -hmm. um, that really galvanized Judge Waring. It led him to the rulings in the white primary cases. It also galvanized President Truman. And the funny thing is, uh, you're all probably familiar with Judge Waring's history, at least in outlines. You know, he married that Yankee Harriet Beecher Stowe divorced his wife at a time when divorce didn't exist in South Carolina. He had the white primary cases, but, uh, and the, of course, seg the segregation ruling in Briggs versus Elliott was his last major case. He'd been on the bench for 10 years. Uh, and people have always debated, what was it that affected, that changed Judge Waring from a, an old time courtly patrician segregationist, so, uh, South Carolinian into Judge Waring. And people say, well, it was marrying that woman. Well, it was the white primary cases. Well, it was this was that. And the interesting thing is uh, Judge Ware, Tom Waring, who's a lawyer in Charleston, now retired, um, went to see Ruby Cornwell. Ruby Cornwell died some years ago at age 100, or I think over 100. She had been a good friend, an African-American, one of Judge Waring's very good friends, uh, and Mrs. Waring. And she knew him very well. And I, I, I knew Ruby Cornwell pretty well. But Tom Waring had gone to her one day and said, I never knew it was, his, I think it was his great uncle. I never knew my great uncle, Judge Waring. Tech, talk to me about him. And he asked, he asked Ruby Cornwell, what was it that changed Judge Waring? And she said, it was that sergeant. It was the case of the sergeant. So that event, which we talk about, and which followed on the Supreme Court's case in another uh, police brutality case, really was what led to Judge Waring's ruling. It led to Harry Truman getting outraged and helping mm -hmm. Truman to become an active civil rights supporter. And so one of the things that I'll bring it back to the book, one of the things that I feel best about is we've drawn so many um, lines and so many connections between things that happened. And this is where the history part comes, is so important and the law part fits into it is we've tried to show how Things lead to other things, and things and things happen in certain ways. It might have happened in different ways, but there's a there's a path here that goes, a stream that goes from older to newer. So anyway, and but to give a little hope for those of us who who are worried about the court these days, there's about a ten thousand page uh, oral history. It may not be that long, but it's very long. I read it in Columbia University on Judge Waring. And someone asked him similar, and there he said that it was the law itself that's why he did that. And that gives me some hope because as he read the law, it was it was the, the great dissenter, uh, yeah. uh, the first Justice Harlan, the same thing, uh, that you put aside your personal feelings. I think in both cases, they actually, their personal feelings caught up with their reading of the law, but initially, as they read the law itself. And that's why I've got to have hope, as bad as some of the rulings are, that these justices, both at the federal level and at the Supreme Court, 
will learn by the law. And it gets even more interesting or exciting because as you know, as, as Brett uh, suggested, all African-Americans asked for first was gas, but us white Southerners are so smart, we refuse to give them the money for gas, let alone a bus. Uh, and so you get to do this ruling. The, the NACP was not ready really to deal with integration of the public schools. You can understand why it was a big issue. It was just even more so about intermarriage between black and white or other groups as well. And they were starting at the graduate level. In fact, most focus had always been on the vote. It was the thing that was most important. It defined citizenship. I remember the great Dr. Mays, Benjamin E. Mays from my hometown, 96, saying uh, about the anti-lynching law, which finally a South Carolina senator, I guess, got passed just recently, Tim Scott. But he said, I could care less about the anti-lynching law. Give us a vote and we can take care of that to have a seat at the table. But Judge Waring convinced, in fact, the attorneys and particularly Thurgood Marshall to go for this with the most unlikely group. I mean, Thurgood Marshall was always worried about this little group. I think they thought they would take a, a major city and uh, where there wouldn't be, the, uh, there would be anonymity, at least some protection for people and things. But it's this white conservative judge that says, this is your opportunity. Go for ending separate but equal. You know? But what he actually said. And yeah. he says, you'll have, it'll go straight to the Supreme Court. You'll have the dissent that makes it, it'll be two to one, but we'll go there. So this goes back to that it was his dissent that gives the roadmap to go forward. It was even more than his dissent. It was sort of his plan, I think, to, to get rid of it. And that's that great ruling, you know, that for the first time ever to say that there is no such thing as separate but equal. Uh, Vernon and, and Armin, you'd be relieved to know that we have a special discussion in the study guide that we've been doing for years now specifically about that historic case where uh, Judge Wadey's told Thurman to, to sit down, kept telling him to sit down. And, and so we, we'll, we'll bring that up again, but it, it's tr truly, truly a significant element. And, is, is, there, is there stuff there about the second white primary case of Judge Waring's? Yeah, the one, yeah, the one where he kept asking the, the, the person that was arguing on behalf of the, the, the state, Questions that he couldn't answer, and, would, the, and yeah. Thurgood, uh, Thurgood kept popping up to answer the questions. He kept on to sit down, and Majeska was there. And I talked to some people that were there. They felt that, oh my God, we're going to lose. And so I don't want to let all the air out of the balloon, though. We'll you, did. you did. What? We'll <laughs> save that and talk about it when we get to it. Dr. Green will handle that class for us. Okay. Well, Armin, tell them our, our part of it. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm sure this is in your part, but I, I, I like it so much, I'll tell it. Um, well, we'll have you back. Okay. Okay. Should I, should I skip it now? Or? Hey, yeah. Uh, no, I'm going to tell it. I'm going to tell it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it's a good story. The first judge wearing threw out the white primary in 1947. The Supreme Court had thrown it out in 1944. South Carolina didn't get the idea. So what South Carolina did was take all the laws uh, about primaries out of the, out of the uh, code book. And they said, we're, we're okay now. Judge Wary said, the heck with that. So he threw out the white primary. Then they came back with something new in 1948. It said, anybody can vote in our primary as long as they take this oath. And the oath is, I am loyal to the principles of segregation and I will defend segregation forever. Uh, mm -hmm. Something like that. So uh, there was a hearing and the hearing was scheduled for, I guess, early July of 1948. It was a few days before the Democratic National Convention was going to be held in, I guess, Philadelphia in 1948. So uh, the defendants in the case uh, were all 46 county chairmen of the Democratic Party, not just the state uh, chair, but all 46 counties. So, the, the Democratic Party filed a motion to uh, continue the hearing uh, so they could go to the Democratic National Convention of Philadelphia. Um, 
and he denied the motion. So they were PO'd as all get out to have to come skip. Well, the problem was that they had to skip the convention, but they weren't going there anyway. They were going to the Dixiecrat convention in uh, Birmingham or wherever it was. So they weren't going anywhere, but they, they all had to be in the courtroom in Charleston in early July for this hearing on the second uh, shot at trying to preserve the uh, white primary. And it was a rancorous hearing. Judge Waring had a couple of people thrown out of the courtroom by the marshals. And at the end, he issued his ruling and he said, I will be in my chambers on primary day if there are any problems. And he says, if there are problems, if there is any non-compliance with this injunction, this court has can enforce it either by fines or by jail sentences. And then he looked at them and he said, gentlemen, there will be no fines. Was that pursuant to the Elmore case? What was he following up on? Probably yeah. this, uh, this was the second one. So this would have been Brown versus Baskin. Okay. Baskin, Billy Baskin was the chair of the uh, county party in Lee County. And I, I met Billy Baskin late, in later years. And the funny thing is, here's this giant, uh, um, he was a chair of Lee County, and I think he's also the chair of the state party. And so he was this mammoth force. And yet he's only about five feet, two inches tall, a very skinny little guy. And I looked at him and wondered how, how did this little guy exercise all this power? But <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> But one of, the, one of the things I really loved about this book is our ability uh, to tell some of these stories that bring these events to real life, because that's what that's what history is. It's just one story after another, right? I mean, you set me up to tell a real story about your life. I, I, I remember running into you uh, when Jimmy Carter was president on the mall, and I was protesting something. I can't remember what it was, but you introduced me to Jody Hamilton and, and Jordan, the, basically Carter's uh -huh. inner staff. But later, you took some friends of mine <laughs> to Washington, D.C. when you were doing the single-member district case. I can't remember whether it was Saluda County or Fairfield County, but this friend of mine uh, told me they didn't know who you were. I mean, you're, you're not the imposing character that, that your your intellect and your victories pretend, pretend, not for pretend, uh -huh. that the, they know who you are, and you're in this rumpled Sears Arthur suit, and you take them into the big building in Washington. And uh, I think when James Holloway told me, he said, we went in that building, and the doors were flying open, and people were yelling, Farmer Darker's in the building, and you thought he was a rock star. <laughs> I just need to share that with you. Matt, you know? Matt and a nickel would get you in the subway, right? <laughs> a great story. <laughs> you are Bernie, why don't you tell story. speaking of stories, which I what which I started. Bernie, why don't you tell the story of Mary Hamilton? I get to tell it most of the time. You ought to have a chance to tell it if you want. Well, I think I I, I identify it with you, but in the book, I, I showed the picture earlier, but it shows how important the Supreme Court uh can be, can be, can be. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the what you said. Never mind. How important the Supreme Court can be. Yeah. How it is. yeah, yeah, and and how it took a case that was uh, for someone who had been fined was it fifty dollars, Armin, and and so many days in jail. Mm -hmm. But Ms. Mary Hamilton. Uh, was a core worker, and this was an Alabama um, case, and she's on the stand, and the, I guess it's a district attorney, uh, starts out, and he says, well, Mary, and she says, my name is Ms. Mary Hamilton, and he no. says, oh, okay, well, Mary, tell us about, and she again no. says, my name is Ms. Mary Hamilton. Those of you from the South understand this, the importance yes. of titles and how they were used as a way to perpetuate white privilege, white supremacy, that you know, African-Americans were never Mr. or Mrs. I remember I wrote, I wrote published somewhere where someone 
in the Columbia paper, the Columbia State was fired because he used Mr. or Mrs., I believe in the 50s, uh, with an African-American uh, thing. And this is what this was all about. So because she refused, the judge told her to answer the question, and she would not unless she was addressed as white women would have been addressed. That is, Ms. Mary Hamilton, they found her guilty, uh, fine of $50 in prison. Well, the Supreme Court take how many cases at a time? Maybe 100, Armin? Something like that. Right. And they found, out, of out of thousands. Yeah. And they took time to take that one case and they ruled in Mary Hamilton's um, favor. And we love to show the picture of her with her pearls on. Um, what an extraordinarily attractive young woman she is and the poise and, and she's a core from out of Iowa and becomes a, actually sort of a, a regional uh, core uh, supervisor. But that's the story of Ms. Mary Hamilton. And we like to use that often as an example of, of what we're trying to do to show the people and the significance and the meaning that the court put on this and the civil rights movement, a simple thing of someone being called Mr. or Ms. who are African-American in the courtroom. Thank you. Yeah. It's part of what made the Warren Court so special. And one of the things that this book has done, I think, for those who read it, is it, it highlights the Warren Court. You know, the Warren Court's been sort of pushed into the background lately, but it was many years ago. Um, but I remember vividly, Vernon does too, and I like to think we have really brought, brought it back into the limelight to, as a contrast to today's non-court. And Armin, can I just tell them about my new hero that I found in this, yeah, in this yeah. book? Um, the Warren Court is not really where it begins. Armin talked about earlier turnarounds, but the real change came with Charles Evan Hughes. I went to Princeton for graduate school and the greatest uh, Woodrow Wilson scholar was there. He sat at his desk, he sat in his chair, he edited the papers, he had the same back problem as Wilson. I always suggest it might be the chair and the desk. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, held the same position in the Presbyterian Church, Arthur Link. But Wilson, of course, had been a historian and president of Princeton, and he was sort of a, a hero to all of us. This is before he sort of started focusing on on his segregating the government. But he was one of the most progressive presidents, despite his segregating the federal government in Washington D.C., particularly for labor and other things and other things he had done. So the person that had run against him one time for president was Charles Evan Hughes, who was sort of seen as a corporate lawyer. But those of you who read The Age of Lincoln know that railroad lawyers, corporate lawyers can be more than one thing. In this case, Charles Evan Hughes was. His father had been an American Baptist uh, minister who had immigrated to the United States. And not to confuse them with the church I grew up in, the Southern Baptist Church, they were very good on race. and we think we figured out as we looked at him where this strong belief comes from and also why is he a story and I liked him. Over and over again when South Carolina uh, cases went to the Supreme Court they would say well the South Carolina Supreme Court said it wasn't about race the language was neutral so it was upheld the bad rulings that were in, that uh, penalized African Americans often send them to the death or, or all sorts of different kind of things like that. Hughes, when he's on the court, and I believe it's the Scottsboro case. You remember the year 14? 35. 35. Um, with one of the Scottsboro case. For the first time, Charles Evan Hughes says, I'd like to see the evidence. Now, no one had really thought about this before, apparently. But he gets evidence, and then they can see how they have doctored the evidence, how they have, in this case, with the jury pool written down who was black and who was white so that they would know not to call black people on the jury. And it goes on and on, an Arkansas case, an Oklahoma case. So the turnaround is really with Charles Evan Hughes. And when he gets to be the Supreme Court justice, and I believe he's the first, he's on the court twice, the second time. And I believe he's the first justice in the new building, isn't he, Armin? The first chief justice? 
uh, and they've just built this beautiful, magnificent building. And there's an Irish guard there who was following the law because remember, um, Woodrow Wilson, this I sort of like this irony as a historian, had segregated uh, the federal government. So the only restaurant was in the building and some black people came in and he stopped and then he bragged to Justice Hughes. He said, you know, some black people tried to eat here, but I stopped them. So Justice Hughes said, come outside with me a moment. He turned around and said, can you read the words over this building's entrance, which of course are equal justice under the law. And he said, if you can't enforce that, I would suggest that you get a new job. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, the restaurant was desegregated. So it sort of comes full force, but the idea of evidence. And again, along with reading the amendments, the 13th, 14th, just as consistently broad as you read the first and second, I really believe that the only way we're gonna change this court is with evidence. Both Armin and I have seen some judges. The first case that I uh, testified in where with Armin uh, was there, I was told the judge who was actually from Topeka, Kansas, wasn't he Armin, and two or 300 years of age? Uh, I, told, I was told that he was uh, right of Genghis Khan by Laughlin McDonald, and don't even worry about it, just get the, just, just get the evidence in and we'll win on appeal. He gave one of the best rulings ever um, by looking at evidence. And so I think evidence is so important when we get discouraged. We have to keep showing people the evidence. Either they're going to have to say, I don't care about evidence, or like your psalm that started with Alito saying, I'm using 13th century for my evidence and not looking at anything about women since the 13th century. Uh, so literally, I think I don't want to be discouraged uh at all because it's very easy to be arm and i we had some bad nights as we we're trying to come to a conclusion because of the court decisions are going the wrong direction from what we would like to see them go but we think we figured out a way to be and positive this is the first time i believe and, I, and I, arm and i think agrees with me but i believe it's the first time the court has really been so out of step with the american public <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to excuse what the kind of cases like we in first Mississippi or Plessy v. Ferguson, but probably the population, certainly the white South, uh, uh, was much more in line with that kind of reason. But today, I really believe in teaching the people we meet. Young people do not want to be prejudiced. They want fairness. And uh, Armin and I have used this example again and again. We never thought we'd see this happen so quickly. But you remember Obama did not want to push gay rights, gay marriage. Clinton did not do it. It was Joe Biden as vice president who sort of forced Obama's hand. And look how quickly, how quickly that's been accepted by young people and others. And I think the same thing is true on race that people don't want anything but equal justice under the law. Uh, and yet the court keeps ruling just the opposite. And it's just, I mean, the only, the only conclusion looking at it as a historian totality of search that it is so partisan. It has become a partisan court and a partisan issue. And I really think it's got to change. Uh, with, that, with that being said, a couple of things. Uh, number one, don't forget that I put a link in the chat to their book, Justice Deferred. If you haven't uh, already ordered it, please do so as soon as possible. It's it's a wonderful book. It's a great book, really important book. But I also want to get a couple to a couple of questions in the chat in the time we have left this, this evening, because one of the questions actually relates to something that Dr. Burton mentioned earlier. Um, this is from Cecil Rigby. He wrote, Dr. Burton, uh, you've made a statement elsewhere that the U.S. has, quote, never enforced Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. It remains unenforced today, end quote. What are some of the repercussions of that today on race relations? Well, it's, it's, uh, you'll have to remind me, is that the one that says if you are disfranchising people or not doing the you lose your representation? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I think we're probably going to be able to use it pretty soon if the court keeps ruling as it looked like it, it has been. And 
as you know, there are the cases right now, the Alabama case is, is a classic one and the North Carolina case. So I, I'm hoping people will use it, but that reminds me not to evade that question uh, because I've learned long ago that I, I think I'm a pretty good historian, but I'm a pretty bad prophet uh, <laughs> in terms of what, we, what we, we could do. But with the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, something that I reminded the Federalist Society of is that every one of those amendments says that Congress has the right to enforce these laws that we have the right, that the state cannot do unfair things to people. And I think that's the other thing that has to happen, that Congress has to step up. We were in this crisis. That's how I got involved with Armand was when, with the Bolden case out of Mobile, they said it did not matter if a law discriminated, in this case, a voting right case that African-American city of Mobile, though they had a large percent of the population, as long as it was at large, could not elect a candidate of choice. And the Supreme Court said, well, you have to show that the intent of the law, that these policy makers intended purposefully that the law would discriminate and keep Black people from electing candidates of their choice. And I remember some wit, New York Times, Birmingham, or somewhere, so what are we going to do? Dig up the stakeholders, the councilmen, and say, did you intend in their graves, get up their corpse out? Did you intend to discriminate when you wrote these laws? And that's what historians do. And we came together and were able to do it. And under Armand's leadership, primarily got Congress to change that law uh, with the Voting Rights Act. And I think this is why you can't just vote, which is the most important thing, but you also have to lobby and get out and make people aware of what they need to do to, to make a difference with the law. But Congress does have that right to enforce that, that positive liberty instead of the negative liberty that we had before the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. All right, and I do see Randall's hand is up. Go ahead, please. Um, Dr. Burton, you make a great point when you talk about what's written, but I keep on hearing all the time that it's one thing to legislate in Congress, but <clears throat> the enforcement is a function of the executive. Now, isn't, doesn't that pose an insurmountable obstacle in terms of making that point? No, I, don't think, I don't think Eisenhower wanted to send troops in, but he did to Little Rock. Uh, again, I think it, I, that's why I think the boat, and both Arm and I go way back working on the boat, is so critical. But one of the things we tried to do in the book, and if we do some more with it, uh, I think we'll do more. There are three branches of government, and they each have roles. Now, right now, the big, the big issue I hear is that the Supreme Court is legislating um, as opposed to uh, Congress with the sort of rulings. But it just seems to me it's just partisan rulings, and particularly with the issues of the vote. Uh, it seems to me that it is clear that trying to use laws to disfranchise but, people yeah. to win elections, uh, and I just don't think that's going to stand up to the American public if they understand what is happening. And it's Thank happening. you, sir. Okay. Um, another question in the chat, this is, this is once again uh, from Cecil Brigby, and this is for Attorney Durfner. I think you might enjoy this question. He asked, uh, why do you call yourself the Forrest Gump of the civil rights movement? I say that again? The why do you call yourself the Forrest Gump of the civil rights movement? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I think maybe it's partly just from living so long. Um, I've been around uh, a lot of events. Um, I mentioned that I knew uh, Mrs. Simpkins. Uh, I was at the March on Washington in 1963. I was in Mississippi when the Voting Rights Act on the first day it began. 
Mm -hmm. I was at the 19, I was at the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Remember that oh, was the one that <laughs> Abby blew up. Well, I was there, but not exactly. I was there with the Mississippi delegation challenging the regulars. So I was there for a meeting of the credentials committee, and we had our hearings, and we won and got the regulars thrown out by something like 105 to 5. And then I went back, and I was actually trying a case, and the next day or so, we were sitting in a motel in Oxford, Mississippi, watching all kinds of mayhem in Chicago, and I was saying, boy, it was pretty quiet while I was there. <laughs> One after another, I've, I've had an opportunity to have sort of a, a ringside seat quietly, not necessarily making a lot of the, the history. Uh, I've had a few little times when I've had a chance to participate, but uh, uh, I've had a lot of uh, opportunity to observe. I was, uh, I argued uh, the, the first major case involving preclearance under the Voting Rights Act in 1968. Um, long before most of you or your parents were even born. And that was uh, an argument before a Supreme Court that had Earl Warren, Thurgood Marshall, Hugo Black, William O. Douglas, giants. A real Supreme Court. It also had Abe Fortas, who would still be, who would not have been kicked off the court if he, uh, if the standards applied to Clarence Thomas today had been applied to him in those days. So I guess I just had a lot of opportunity to be around and, and and be present at a lot of things that happen, even if I didn't play that much of a role in making them happen. And I enjoy being I enjoy being so old that I keep keep referring to things as uh, you know half a century ago when I was younger. <laughs> Armin was born Robert, in Paris. Robert, would you please oh, tell? Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I uh, yeah, my, my parents and I left on my second birthday. Which was the same night that Hitler came into Paris. So I guess that's another piece of it. And the, and that's why I like the uh, Casablanca story. I tell Armin that he took the place of uh, who was the starlet, and pulled them up, uh, um, Ingrid Bergman, that he got her seat. And the, yeah. <laughs> Did you have a? No, I was going to make a statement on that. Probably in in, in the room, I'm the oldest because I'm 87 and I can share many of the stories that he told. Great. <laughs> All right, and Sarah, I thought you had your hand raised as well. Did, uh, I don't know if this is irrelevant or not, but he did mention Clarence Thomas. As a historian, can you share with us, have we ever had anybody accused of such a uh, group on oh, the Supreme Court sure. and what has happened to them? The Negro wasn't unique. <laughs> Well, all, all, you know, you all have heard what I've heard in the news, but the one thing I am confident of is we haven't heard the last of it. I think there's, in fact, with, with his, if you want to use a, a, a kind word, carelessness in filling out these forms or not filling them out, I think yeah. there's more, it is more we're going to learn. Unfortunately, I don't think anything's going to happen, but he <laughs> ought to be off the court. He ought to be off the court. But historically, have there been others? Well, Armin mentioned the Abe Fortas thing, which seems nothing compared to this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What was he accused of? Fortas. Fortas, uh, Fortas had two main things. One was that um, there was a, a person named Louis Wolfson, who was a little bit of a shady businessman. Uh, who had a case going on, the F Federal Trade Commission was after him, and I think they, there was a theory the case might eventually get to the Supreme Court, but I don't think it was there at the time. But he, he uh, uh, got Fortas to agree to, I guess, be an advisor to some foundation of his and send him some money, I think $25,000, which is a lot of money in those days, uh, and Fortas Send it back to him, but not for six months or so. And so this was the main thing. A second thing, which I don't quite understand why it was so important, uh, Fortis gave a series of lectures at a law school, and the fee 
the, the money for his fee was raised by some of his former law partners in his law firm. And that's my recollection of what he did. But mostly it was the first thing, the, associate, the association of sorts with Louis Wolfson. So when you compare Clarence Thomas and uh, this fellow, what's his name? Crow, who, who has been subsidizing Ginny Thomas uh, through various foundations and has been bankrolling foundations for years and years. And Thomas is voting on all these cases, including cases where his wife is very closely involved. I don't see the difference. Oh, no, was Fortis uh, the first Jewish justice? Yes. Sorry, what? Was, Jewish was Fortis the first Jewish justice? No, Fortis was, uh, were, well, Justice Brandeis was the first Jewish justice. Okay. But being the first of something is not necessarily auspicious. I think, I think I'm not sure, but I think Roger Tony was the first Catholic justice. So sometimes the first is not necessarily the best. Yeah, Marilyn claims Tawny, and it's the first thing we're taught in sixth grade Marilyn history. Okay. Well, you know, his statue. I'm glad you came to South Carolina after learning that. <laughs> <laughs> Tawny's statue was recently pulled down. It used to occupy a place of honor in the middle of Baltimore. It's been pulled down and sent off to some warehouse or something. You know, Armin and I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post. Do you want to do that, Armin? Just very. No, you go ahead. You go ahead, Bert. Sure. Well, it it gets too long a story. Maybe we should wait. Uh, no, go for it. No, go right ahead. Well, it's yeah. it's it's uh, as you can tell, I'm a great Thurgood Marshall fan, and uh, we talked about Thurgood. He really only had one good friend on the court at the end, and that was William Brennan. So this will strike home how South Carolina comes into all of this. 1980, of course, is the Reagan Revolution. And the person who had been chair of the Judiciary Committee had been Ted Kennedy. And whatever you think of Chappaquiddick, he was actually very good and uh, uh, had a good relationship both with Brennan and with Thurgood Marshall, two liberal justices. And Brennan is a very small physically a small man, giant intellectually. And of course, Thurgood Marshall is not only a giant intellectually, but he's a huge man. Big man. Yes, big. very, very big, imposing. And and uh, this was reported by uh, Stephen Carter, who was, uh, who was, I believe, one of the uh, clerks for, for Justice uh, Marshall. And Armin, why would Armin tell? I sometimes break up crime when I tell this story here. It, it touched me so much. So Brennan rushes up to Thurgood Marshall, and they're both dressed in their robes. Is, is it true, is it true, is it true that Strom Thurmond is now chair of the Judiciary Committee? And you have to know the backstory of this, because Strom Thurmond, whatever you thought of him, was actually very smart, very able to grill people. And uh, when Thurgood Marshall, well, you disagree. Or, yeah. but, but, but those of us who are not super- More low cunning, but not smart. But he he gave our good Marshall the Dickens. So are you a communist? Don't you belong to a communist organization? Don't you work for you know? The, there was no love lost there both times for his you know, and the Supreme Court appointment. Just very bad. So Thurgood Marshall puts his arm around Brennan, and they sort of march off their chambers together in their robes. It's giant man and this smaller physically stature man and to me it's like these two great social justice warriors going off to their last uh, fights but what happened is brennan leaves the court norman can tell you that story about why that is with his you know in any rate uh thurgood marshall used to tell a lot of raunchy and racy stories one of them he would say is he was never going to resign from the court. And this gets into an issue we see, uh, in fact, with Diane Feinstein now in the Senate. Uh, yeah. We talk about cases in the court where the justices are just out of it, but they, they have to resign. You cannot remove a justice. And this will be interesting about Clarence Thomas. But Thurgood Marsh said he would never retire. He expected to be shot in bed by a jealous husband when he's 110 years of age. <laughs> but with 
he's suffering very badly. He's missing his friend. He's feeling very lonely on the court and he's in very bad, excruciating pain and health. And it is, uh, people forget because Bill Clinton came from nowhere and won. No one saw Ross Perot, but after the first Iraq war, the first George Bush ratings, poll ratings were like an 80% approval rating. So Marshall resigned. He thought it's not going to matter. Of course, he lived past Bill Clinton's inauguration. So it would have been Bill Clinton who would have appointed, who became, of course, Clarence Thomas, probably Judge Higginbottom, but it would certainly have been somebody very different, Clarence Thomas, in terms of political views. Then you fast forward to the 2000 election with Al Gore and George Bush, and it's one vote, Clarence Thomas votes on the hanging chads. Just think about how what historians talk about contingency chance that things can change, how that would have changed our court that we have now to what we would have had. Kind exactly. of things. And that's something you cannot predict. Um, I the think. whole Iraq thing. I wish I yeah. had <laughs> All right, so we are almost out of time. I do have one last question on the post to the two of you. Uh, yeah. oh, go ahead, please. Let, let me just add one little thing because this is a Mojeska Simpkins class. Uh, Vernon referred to good old Strom Thurmond. No, she hated it. But Jessica had a perfect name for him. She she always referred to Strom Thurmond as the Grand Rascal, the Grand Rascal, and that was her Jessica's name for Strom. Now the two of you have have dealt extensively with issues of voting rights, and to close out this evening's class, um, could you briefly talk about what you both see as what needs to be done on voting rights, whether it's in the legislative area, judicial, or what have you, what do you think can be done to really essentially save voting rights in this country? Change the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I, I think the evidence is, that's, is that's the way to go. We have to, if, if they're going to make these bad rulings, they're going to have to explain away the evidence. And they're not above that. I mean, they do it quite often, it seems to me. But I think we have to do it. And also, they are not immune to protest. I think people have to get in movement. Yes. And I mean, first of all, you have to vote. You yeah. have to vote. You make it. We've got to mobilize people to vote. I won't tell people how to vote, but we want everybody to vote. But secondly, we need to mobilize. We've got to get people so they can see that people care about these issues, that they matter. And then the third is what I said, is presenting the evidence that what they are doing is clearly against the law, unconstitutional, the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment. As Armin had said, we really believe, though, that the 14th Amendment has just been gutted so badly with 80% of the cases about corporations as people. But the 13th Amendment is still there, and it says that, you know, it's been interpreted and ruled uh, that it undoes or is to get rid of those badges of slavery. You go into a McDonald's and see who's taking the order, and it's usually a white kid who's flipping the burgers, a black or a Latinx or like that. Those are badges of slavery. It's exactly what they meant by that term. And so, so I think they have to, if, if they can recognize that the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment are as much a part of the Constitution as the First and Second Amendment, then I don't see how they can rule otherwise, though they have been ruling otherwise because in the words that Armour would let not not let me put in the book, Judge Roberts, where things are not as they were. And uh, yeah. I do think they're getting worse. I, I'll, add, I'll add one thing. I think uh, what we've seen, Vernon talks about mobilization. We've seen that recently in the response to the abortion ruling. Right. Uh, it, has, it has galvanized uh, a lot of people and uh, uh, women, young people, a lot of people of goodwill. And I think what, that's where we can learn a lesson and carry it forward. Here, here. All right, on that note, let's give our two guests a great round of applause. And thank you for a wonderful class this evening. And thank you both for joining us tonight. We all learned a lot, that's for sure. Um, now, to give you a quick heads up on what's coming up for the class, um, this coming Sunday,
April 23rd, we have a, another deeper dive uh, conversation, this time with Dr. Eric Gelman of UNC Chapel Hill. He is here to talk about his book, uh, Death, Blow, and Jim Crow, and the Southern Negro Youth Congress, which was integral in the great and often unheralded human rights campaign in the 1930s and 40s. That is this Sunday from 4 to 6 p.m. That's our deeper dive coming up. And then next Monday for class number eight, we'll be inviting the folks from the uh, USC Center for Civil Rights History and Research. They'll talk a bit about the work they've been doing here in Columbia and across the state about civil rights history in South Carolina. So that's next Monday, right here, 6.30, same bad time, same bad channel. A joke which my students do not get at all. Well, thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Carmen. We appreciate Carmen and, and um, Vernon greatly. You're asking, you're, you're, you're state treasurers for sure, and I'm glad to get to share you with other people. Everybody, it's come to my attention that it's Dr. Burton's birthday, and you know what that means, right? <laughs> Happy birthday. Hey, no, 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 Marjorie. Let's all unmute, unmute, unmute. unmute, unmute. Okay. You need that. Unmute everybody. And here we go. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, birthday, Dr. Birthday. Happy birthday to you. To you. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought the Clemson tradition was that when it's your birthday, you turn a can of gay, a barrel of Gatorade over his head. <laughs> I'm too cheap for that. I would uh, say the <laughs> <laughs> what year was that? Or what year was that, Vernon? What year was what, Brett? The, 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 the year we're celebrating. Oh, I, I, I just turned 76, and I was born hey. on my whole birthday. <laughs> my grandson was born on mine, so there you go. Uh, well, we're, yeah. Bye. <laughs> and, uh, 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 everyone have a wonderful Monday. Next time I'll sing. <laughs> Next time I won't. <laughs> to give people something to look forward to. <laughs> Don't come back here.